Uh, I wanted to welcome everyone to another very special edition of Baseball for All's live Q&A. I'm Alina Park and I head up the media content and some of the programming aspects of Baseball for All. And uh, joining us today, uh, we've also got Baseball for All's founder, Justine Siegel, with us as well. Hi, Justine. Everyone. Thank you, Wendy, so much. Um, so, you know, we're all so excited and honored to have the incredible Wendy Selig Preeb join us today. Uh, starting in the mid 90s, she was already a trailblazer in baseball. Um, after earning her law degree from Marquette University, she uh, became the first woman to represent Major League Baseball during its collective bargaining with the MLB Players Association. And then after that, she worked as the president, CEO, and chairman of the Milwaukee Brewers, and was the only female president and uh, chairman of an MLB club during that time. And for those of you detectives out there, if part of her last name sounds familiar, it may be because she is also former MLB commissioner, uh, Bud Selig's daughter as well. Um, and today, Wendy is uh, a celebrated and respected businesswoman who has worked in a number of different industries, from sports to fashion and everything in between. And we're so, so honored to have you speak to our players today um, about what it means to excel as a leader on and off the field and what it takes to lead and succeed, and succeed at the highest levels of baseball. So thank you so much for joining us today, Wendy. Thanks, and I'm really glad to be with you guys. Um, there is nothing I like better than talking to a group of driven, high achieving women, and especially young women. So I find you guys particularly inspirational. So I'm really excited to be with you tonight. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, so I mean, just so you know, Wendy, like you just said, you know, we've got girls in baseball and their coaches who come from all over the country who are on with us today. And they're, you know, as young as eight or nine or 10 and, then older than that. Um, so we're, we're very excited to get started. And I know that some of you are joining our Q&A for the first time, so I'll give you a quick rundown of how this will work. So if you look at the chat box there that's in the corner, um, you will see instructions on how to add your questions. And I will call on you one at a time um, for you to ask your questions to Wendy. So we'll be prioritizing players' questions first, but if you're a coach or parent and would like to ask one as well, please do feel free to type them in as well. So, Wendy, you don't need to look at the chat box unless you'd really like to, and I'll uh, be able to mod uh, moderate. All yours. Okay. All <laughs> Perfect. It. All right. Um, so we'll just, I think we'll just dive in with questions. Um, we'll start with, um, we'll start with Olivia uh, Keen, who is from Oregon. Go ahead, Olivia. Hi, I'm Olivia Keen, and I'm 16. And my question was, as a junior in high school and like going into senior year in college, what classes should I be forecasting for a position, like a business position in baseball or just any position? Hi, Olivia. Well, it's so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And um, you're at such an exciting stage um, in your high school. So here's what I would tell you. It isn't so much about any specific class, but I'm a big believer in exposing yourself to as many different things as you can. And so if, for example, um, you know, I was a history loving, um, good writer, analytical, so those kind of classes were really, I'm not gonna say easy for me, but that was kind of in my wheelhouse, right? But sometimes I forced myself to take classes that were outside of that. And I found that I had interests that I didn't even know about. Or maybe it was just kind of teaching me to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And I'm going to tell you a story about when I was in law school. I went to law school absolutely singularly focused. I wanted to be a labor attorney. No attorneys in my family. So I really didn't know that much about practicing law, but I had had some experience working um, within labor before, and so that's what I wanted to do. And then when you're in law school, you don't get to choose many of your classes until you get to your last year. And so I had to take corporations, and I was not interested in corporate law, I didn't think, but I had to take it. Well, 
P.S. I turned out to be a corporate attorney. And what I realized is corporate law is really much more about transactions and finding common ground, whereas labor law is more being a litigator. And my personality and my skills are better suited to that. So that's a long-winded way of saying it isn't so much that there's a specific class or specific things that you have to study if you want to get into sports or sports administration because you're really young and even for those of us who aren't so young I still practice what I preach and I try to learn new things and it's part of being able to grow and sometimes you have to reinvent yourself and sometimes the the job of a life Time doesn't last a lifetime. So the more things that you can be exposed to and find out that you're interested in or not interested in, that's equally important. Um, that's really what I would encourage you to do. And good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much. Awesome. All right, we've got another question in a kind of a different direction from Hannah, who's from Arizona. Go ahead, Hannah. Hi, I'm Hannah, and I'm 13 Hi. years old. And I was wondering, did you ever want to play baseball as a kid or did you ever? So Hannah, first of all, I have to ask you where in Arizona you live because I live in New York City right now, but for 11 years before I relocated to New York, I was in Arizona and I love Arizona. So what part of Arizona are you in? I live in a small town right next to Tucson called Vail. Okay, great, great, great. Well, I know the general area, so lucky you. Um, I always loved the game from the time that I was really young. Um, but uh, ironically, when I was more around your guys' age, if you'd asked me what I wanted to be, and I could wave a magic wand and be anything I wanted to be, I wanted to be, there was a very successful female tennis player then, Chris Everett, who hopefully you guys have heard of. And she was um, really dominant when I was growing up. And I played tennis um, in grade school and high school. But unfortunately, I did not have her talent. So eventually I realized that just because I had a two-handed backhand like her was not going to take me to Wimbledon. And um, fortunately, my studies and other things helped me to find other areas. But much as I loved the game, I really never played. And when I was in school, of course, we didn't really have the opportunities that you guys have today. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks, Hannah. All right, we've got another question here from Ella, who's from Hawaii. Ella? Hi, I'm Ella, I'm 13. I'm from Oahu, Hawaii. Oh. And my question was, um, what do you enjoy most about your job? So Ella, that's a great question. Um, and I've been really fortunate in my career that I have done really different things. You heard a little bit about it during my introduction. But um, I think the most important thing that I have learned, I, you know, you have to do something that you're really passionate about. And that's, I'm a person who's all about passion, hard work. You don't have to be the smartest. You don't have to be the most gifted athlete on the field to be the MVP. What you have to have is unbridled passion and purpose. You have to know why you do what you do. And so whether I was practicing law, when I was running the brewers, we did, it was, it was sort of the best of worlds and the worst of worlds. We um, got to, we built a new ballpark, Miller Park. Hopefully you guys, if you haven't been there, you've at least seen games on TV, very proud of it, great ballpark. Um, and rebuilt our organization and did some great things, but also had lots of struggles. So whatever you do, when you look at certain people, their careers can look really uh, glamorous from the outside. And there may be things about them which are glamorous. But at the end of the day, I don't care what you do. It takes hard work, dedication, resiliency, because you will get knocked down. The only, I assure you guys, you're going to get knocked down a lot. You're going to get knocked down in college. You'll get knocked down on the field. You'll get knocked down different places. And the key is to always get back up. 
And so what helps me get up in whatever challenges I have had in various careers is I'm passionate about what I'm doing. I know why I'm doing it. And I believe in what our mission is. And so I was involved first in law, then in baseball for 15 years. And then I got involved with a women's fashion company, kind of on a lark, to be honest with you, and ultimately became the president of that company and ran it for a while and uh, loved, loved, loved that as well. A very, very different kind of business. But that gives you an idea if you are open to opportunities and willing to say yes when opportunities arise or raise your hand and say, I'm interested, um, that's how you get to do a lot of different and really interesting things. Thank you. Good luck. Awesome. All right, we've got a question here from Kate, who is from Southern California, all of the warm weather states apparently right now. Um, go ahead, Kate. Oh, hi, I'm Kate. Well, I'm 13 years old. So did you work for the Brewers before you became the CEO, president, and chairman? And if so, what was it? Yes, Kate, good question. I'm trying to see your cap. What does your cap say? I can't just cut off there. Oh, it's the Dodgers spring training hat. Ah, very good. Okay, so a Dodgers fan. I won't hold that against you. Um, so um, I joined the Brewers as general counsel because I'm a lawyer by training. And before I joined the Brewers, I was practicing law in a large corporate law firm. And that's really great training um, for any lawyer. Um, and most lawyers, not all, but most lawyers before they go in-house, whether it's in sports or in any other business, tend to start in a law firm. So I started and you know, I worked hard to get through law school. And I, I actually, I loved law school. I like school. I guess, I guess that's a, a theme in my life, um, that I was a, a good student and I always liked school. And so the same for me was true with law school. Um, and it's not easy. And so I worked hard to get my law degree. And practicing law was what I thought I wanted to do. And sort of on that theme of keeping an open mind, when I joined the Brewers, my, my role was really to oversee the legal affairs of the club, as you would expect, but then also to, um, I hate to use a football term, but quarterback uh, our efforts and initiative to get a new ballpark. And as I started to work with the team after a couple years, I realized that I was really interested in the business side. And I kept getting pulled more into deals that we were doing and various business issues. And it just sort of evolved. So I know a lot of times at your guys' age, you sort of think, oh, I have to have a plan. You know, where should I be in five years? And what should my first job be? If I had tried to plot out my life, I would have sold myself short. In a million years, there are things that I've done, I was scared to death, I would never. If you had told me when I was running the Brewers that I would run a fashion company, I would have laughed at you. So sometimes you just don't know what opportunities are there. So you start one place, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's where you're going to end up. So I hope that helped too. All right, thank you. Great question, you guys. Um, we've got another question here from Leah. Um, Leah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Leah. I'm 13. If you were to hire a female to a coaching role in MLB, what traits, education, experience would you look for in them? Leah, tell me the beginning of that again. If you were to hire a female to a coaching role in MLB, Got it. what traits, education, experience would you look for? First of all, I see Yankees logos behind you. <laughs> a Yankee fan? Yeah. I uh, love New okay. Yankees, Dodgers. Where's my Brewer fans on here? Um, okay, so what traits would I look for in a coach? Female coach, you asked me. But, you know, I'm going to tell you something. I don't look for different traits in different gen because of somebody's gender. I figure out what the profile is that's going to make somebody successful in a position. 
And, um, you know, if you're in a coaching position, you're in a leadership position, you have, think what you guys want in your coaches. You want someone who's a good communicator. You want somebody who can teach. You want someone who can motivate you. So none of those are gender specific traits. What I'm gonna say to you guys is what I have seen in my career, and it's even been true of me, if I'm, you know, true confessions and honest with you guys. Men, there's much research that shows men will go for a position if they feel they have about 60% of what the position requires. And they just assume they'll figure the rest out. Women, and again, I'm going to put myself, I have made this mistake. I don't want you guys to make it. But I, you know, many of us have. We think we look at a job description. We look at a college that we might be interested in. And we look at a team that we might want to play for. And if we can't check off every box, we think, well, we can't do it. Well, many times, some one person can't check off every box. So it's looking for, it's always finding the right fit. And ultimately, that's knowing not only the experience and knowledge that you bring to the table, but probably the biggest thing that I look for when I'm hiring somebody into a leadership position, two things. And you guys as athletes should be able to demonstrate this as you get further along, um, both in college applications and then ultimately internships and working. I look for two things. I want people who are lifelong learners. Because I don't care what you know today, what you know tomorrow, I'm a lot older than you. Um, you have to constantly be learning or you're gonna be left behind. And the other thing I look for is resilience. Because, and, and the times that we find ourselves, and I do consulting now for businesses, no business is prepared for the challenges that COVID-19 has presented. No doubt in your own schools, your own lives, your own fitness routines, you've found that it's, it's hard. Nobody ever anticipated that we would be in the circumstances that we are. And so there are people who, when they get into these kind of situations, can almost become paralyzed by fear, by the ambiguity, by the uncertainty. And there's other people who just really have that I'm going to figure it out. We're going to break this down. And those are the kind of skills that I look for when I'm hiring somebody in a leadership position. So I hope that helps you. Thank you. Great question and great answer. Um, we're going to move over to Olivia, who is also from New York. Go ahead, Olivia. Hi. Um, so you were a member of the Commissioner's Initiative on Women in Baseball, right? Yes. So while, while you were in that position, what did you do to bring more women and families into the baseball community? That's a great question, Olivia. But before I answer, I'm going to ask you a question. Yankees or Mets? Mets. Okay. Yay, a Mets fan here. Okay, way to yeah. go. Um, all right. You. So what did I do? Uh, first of all, I'm going to say to you, that that was the first initiative that Major League Baseball ever had specifically focused on women and women as fans. So um, I, uh, our goal was to help the sport better market and position itself to women and specifically casual fans. So women like all of us, right? We read the sports page, we know what's going on. Um, we're very, very, very savvy, smart fans. Many fans who come to the ballpark, one of the things that I love about baseball, you can come and you can want to second guess the manager and every decision he makes. Why did he pinch hit there? I would have had that guy bunt. I would have taken the pitcher out. You know, all sorts of things, right? And I'm sure you guys do that when you go to games. And you can enjoy it at that level. You can be like me and you love to keep score and, and you're really into the game. 
you can also come to the ballpark and basically know there's nine innings, three outs, you love the hot dogs, you love the peanuts, you love the, the, the atmosphere of the ballpark and you see it as fun, affordable family entertainment. And we as an industry, um, especially then, needed to do a better job of reaching out to the casual fan. A rabid fan, no problem, You're, you, that, that's easy. But if you think about it, these ballparks are big, 40,000, 50,000 people, 81 home games. That's a lot of people to bring into your ballpark. And so you have to also appeal to the casual fan. And if you don't know this, you should know that 85% of the purchases of consumer goods and decisions about entertainment in families are made by the mother. So if the mother, if you, if you only advertise for your games, and I'm sort of dating myself talking about sports pages, right? So let's talk about, you know, online, ESPN, um, whatever digital platforms uh, today. If you're only in the, the platforms that are specifically targeted to the sports fan, Barstool, all these different great ones, you're not going to find the casual fan there. That mom who's just trying to figure out some fun, family entertainment for the weekend, you, gotta, you need to start to talk to her where she is. And so that was a big piece of what we did to help to expand the fan base and the popularity of the sport. Okay, thank you so much. And Great go Mets. <laughs> Great question and um, way to do your homework, Olivia. Nice job. <laughs> Um, we got another question here coming from Sarah, who is from upstate New York. Sarah, go ahead. So when people tell you that you only have your job because of your dad, what do you tell them? So Sarah, that's a really great question. But of course, I'm going to ask you now the same question. Everybody's getting it. Tell me your team. Um, I am a Mets fan. Okay. I thought you were going to say Yankees. Good. Um, so... You know, and you guys will deal with this to some extent, too. People sometimes have unconscious bias, and sometimes they have conscious bias, okay? That's the reality. Um, in my case, I, in a sense, had three strikes against me. Because back in the early 90s, I joined the team in 1990, very few female executives in professional sports, at that, male sports at that time. Um, so I was a woman, I was young, and I was the boss's daughter. Okay, so people could say, okay, she's only there because, you know, she's Bud Seelig's daughter. Yeah, I'm Bud Seelig's daughter, and I'm proud of it. But that certainly provides an opportunity because I grew up around the game. But at the end of the day, you have to perform. And at the end of the day, you got to get the job done. And you either do or you don't. And I always felt that it should neither work to my advantage or, quite frankly, my disadvantage. Do I think sometimes people were watching me too soon or maybe started out with a preconceived... If my name had been Wendy Smith or William Smith, they would have had no preconceived idea about me, would they? But because you're the boss's daughter, because you're a woman, or because you're young, it's easy to have a preconceived idea that is not based on facts. And I am a facts and data person. And so I would say to you guys, be conscious of your own unconscious biases. We all have them, um, but being conscious of them helps us to deal with that. And so what I would say to you is I learned really early on to develop a thick skin and to prove myself I'm really hard working. Um, I made mistakes along the way and I'm gonna say this to you guys right now because I think sometimes when I talk to really young, high achieving women like you and, and people like you, um, 
and I, we all do it. You, you know, you, you want to be perfect. You want to succeed. You want to win. Um, but the reality is successful people don't succeed because they never fail. They succeed because they never quit. Two different things. And did I have failures and mistakes and, you know, things along the way and setbacks and obstacles, some of my own doing, some not of my own doing? You bet. But I never stopped. And I never, I always, um, you know, I'm pretty tenacious. So that's what I would say to you. And I would say that the sooner that you have to overcome some barrier or bias like that, the better, because that is the real world. That just happens to have been what my first one was, and a lot of people knew it. You know, I'd be asked, I did a lot of media interviews, um, in part because that's what you do when you run a major league baseball team. But I also did a lot of speaking engagements. And I was almost always asked about being, not about being, interestingly, not about being my father's daughter. I was asked the woman question all the time. What does it feel like to be a woman in baseball? What is it, you know, what, what, what is, what, what's that like? Well, first of all, it's the only point of reference I have. It's not like in my previous life, I was a male in baseball. So I know my experiences. But what I, the point that I always made, I always answered the question for media. But before I did, I asked them a question. I said, I'm going to answer your question. But I want to know about your newspaper, or your TV station. And I want to know your publisher, your leadership team. How many women are on that team? I knew the answer. No, and I said, I was with a corporate law firm and I'm very proud of what I did. How, I was never asked the question. I, I, I didn't deal with any female clients. All of the, I was in the transactional area for corporate law. It was all male at that time, all male, no female partners. Nobody ever asked me what it felt like to be a woman practicing law in, 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 corporate, in the corporate world. But as soon as I joined the baseball team, I got asked that. And actually, I welcomed the question because baseball has always been, and you guys should be proud of this, at the forefront of opening doors. And when I joined baseball, what I would tell you is more than a gender bias. I think there was a bias if you hadn't played the game and not as many women play the way you guys play now. So there was, so it wasn't, yes, it, there was a male, female, bias to some extent, but there was also a bigger bias that if you hadn't played the game, how could you know how to scout? If you hadn't played the game, how could you be in player development? How could you market the game? You know, how could you do any of the things that we do? And as the business became a more sophisticated, competitive business, it opened up opportunities, much broader opportunities, right? No longer, who cares if you played or you didn't play? The question is, do you have the qualifications to do the job? So that actually is a great equalizer. But what I would say is always important to make sure, I believe talent is equal. Opportunity is not always equal. And so that's what I fight for. Thank you. Yeah, I think that, you know, whether it's fortunate or not, a lot of these girls right now have have to put up with a lot of, you know, barriers and people telling them that they, you know, should quit just based on their gender. So, I mean, for you to put kind of the spin on this that, you know, the sooner they can kind of encounter that and get that out of the way, you know, the better off they'll be, I think is, um, I think that's very reassuring to hear. It's really true, guys. I promise. I promise. Um, awesome. Okay, we're going to move to uh, Sabra from uh, from California. Go ahead, Sabra. Hi, I'm 14. Um, do you think that you had a lot of pressure on your back being like the daughter of the MLB commissioner to succeed? Yeah, so Sabra, that's a good question. Now, what part of California are you from? I'm from the Bay Area. Giants or A's? There's only one right answer, Giants. <laughs> okay. Um, 
so you know what I would say to you when you are, whether you are, well, first, when I joined the Brewers, my father was not commissioner. He was the president and general managing partner of the Brewers. So he didn't become commissioner until later. But um, yes, in that when you are different in some way, people look at you a lot earlier than they would otherwise. So whether you're the boss's daughter, whether you're the only woman, whether you're the youngest one, when, you, when there's something about you that is novel and different, um, I do think that probably the biggest thing is people look at you earlier than they otherwise would. So you have to just get comfortable with that. Um, and um, I'd also say that it makes you develop a self-confidence. So I'm going to share with you guys, I hope that you guys don't have this, but if you do, I'm going to share something with you that might be helpful. So Ariana Huffington, I don't know if you guys know who she is. She's a great thought leader, started Huffington Post and, and now runs a different company. But uh, I heard her speak one day and something she said really resonated with me because my biggest critic is not any media or fans. Like, I, you guys are all so polite. I, you know, when you run a baseball team, you've dealt with angry season ticket holders and angry fans and angry media. And so you, you, you kind of toughen up, or you better toughen up, or you get eaten up alive. But um, those are not, that's not my toughest critic. My toughest critic lives in my head and it's what ariana huffington calls the nasty roommate and i'm going to say that that nasty roommate sometimes lives rent free in my head warning me of all the things that might go wrong or that you know i might i might miss something or i oh i should have said it that way or i should have done this and so that's something even to this day, that I sometimes have to have a little conversation with that roommate and tell her, tone it down, you know? So that's what I would say to you. You know, there's gonna be critics, there's always critics. It's easy to be a critic. Easy, easy, easy. It's the easiest thing, you know what? And in some ways it's the all American sport because everyone can do it. And everybody thinks, especially when you run a baseball team, that they can do it better than you. Um, and that's part of what makes baseball so great, right? It's such a relatable sport. People will sit there, somebody who's not even athletic, and a third baseman will miss, you know, he, he'll, he'll um, make an error. And you'll hear, you'll hear a guy that you look at that you know couldn't have made the play say, oh, my gosh, what's wrong with him? I could have made that play. And that's part of what makes baseball so great right? It's so relatable. Players are not huge. They're not seven feet tall. They look like us. And so um, as you think about and deal with that criticism, whether it's a nasty voice inside your own head or somebody who's challenging a decision that you're making, as long as you know why you're doing it, and you're passionate about it, just keep going. Don't let anyone deter you. Now, having said that, sometimes in life, you take a pivot. I've taken pivots in my life that have turned out amazingly well for me that I never could have imagined because as you get older, your opportunities and your priorities sometimes change. So, you know, while you're 13, 14, 15, you know, I wanted to be the next Chris Everett. That wasn't going to happen. But I wasn't going to just fold up my tent, right? I had to figure out what was going to happen for me. And so being open and open to opportunities and just saying yes, even if it's something you're not sure about, give it a try. If it's not for you, great. It's as important to find out what's not for you as it is to find out what really gets you excited. Thank you. Thank you.
Awesome. Um, we are going to move on to Kennedy, who's from New Jersey, I believe. Go ahead, Kennedy. What was the toughest decision you had to make while you were with the Brewers? Oh, Kennedy, that's a great question. You're from New Jersey? Yeah. Where in New Jersey? Uh, Bayonne. It's right by New York City. Okay, yeah, close to me. I'm in New York. And who's your team? The Royals. The Royals. Now, how do you, how do you become a Royals fan living in New Jersey? It's my initials, AC. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. Okay, well, your former manager, Ned Yost, uh, he was our manager. Yeah, you know, he was the Brewers manager. So I was a big fan. I know he, he's retired now, but he was a great guy. But I can't pull for the Royals too. I have a lot of friends with them. So um, now tell me what your question was. I got all distracted. Oh, toughest decision I had to make. Um, hmm. A lot of really tough decisions. It's hard for me to narrow it down to one. So I'm going to give you, as I think about it, um, some of the toughest challenges. So we, when I joined the Brewers, we were, they were moving forward with a new ballpark and it looked like everything was sort of coming together and I really wanted to be involved in that on day one. That ended up being, what, what we thought was on track ended up being a 10 year mission. So, so many twists and turns and political machinations and all sorts of things that happened. Now it all ended well, but 10 years is a long time, especially for something that you thought was going to happen within the next two or three years. So lots of um, different twists and turns that were agonizing for me personally for, for our organization as well. Um, I was also involved in, um, I think in the introduction you mentioned it, I was involved in the labor negotiations in 94 and 95 during the strike in which the only World Series that was not played due to a strike. Um, and that was just a gut-wrenching time, just gut-wrenching. Um, so that was very difficult. And I think if I had to say really the hardest individual decisions are always decisions about personnel. So when you, when, you know, you think, oh, I want to be the boss someday, right? You all think that. And I want you all to want to be the boss, but it's not easy, right? You have to make decisions about not only who you're going to hire, but sometimes you have to go a different direction. You watch it, you're all baseball fans. You see managers get changed. You see general managers get changed. Um, those are gut-wrenching decisions when you have to make personnel decisions because you're dealing with people's lives and people's livelihoods. And what I found when I was running the Brewers, whatever decisions I had to make, I always asked myself, Am I doing what is in the best interest of the Milwaukee Brewers and our fans? And that was my guiding principle. It doesn't mean every decision I made was right, but it means that I always knew I was doing it for the right reason. I wasn't doing it because it was easy. I wasn't not doing it because it was hard. Um, and I think likewise, as you guys come upon hard decisions, Always make sure you're doing it for the right reason. If you, sometimes a decision will work out, sometimes it won't. You can make adjustments if it isn't the right decision. We all have to do it. But when you're really faced with a hard decision, sometimes it's, you know, everyone says, write down the pros and the cons on one side and all these different things. And you can do all that. But at the end of the day, that's all process. You still got to make a decision. And so that really always helped me when I had to confront a particularly difficult situation. So I hope that helps. And go Royals. Thanks, Kennedy. Um, all right, we've got another question here coming from Elena. Elena, go ahead. And if you're talking right now, I think you're on mute, I'm trying to find you. Can you hear me now? Oh yeah, go ahead, Elena. 
Okay, so I'm Elena Torres. I'm from Los Angeles. My question for you is, um, how does it feel to be the only girl and chairman and president for the MLB club? Dodgers fan or Angels fan? Dodgers. Dodgers. Of course. Um, okay, we are definitely, the coasts are really well represented on these, on, on this call. So when you guys, and I don't know if any of you guys have had the experience to be the only woman in a room on a team, but it will happen. And don't let it deter you. Um, I've done it. I've done it many times. I, I didn't, here's the thing, guys. I didn't go about, I didn't want to be the only woman to do something. I didn't, I never wanted to be the first woman to do anything. It was never, my goals are hard work, specific. I just happened to find myself in that role numerous times. Um, and I will say that for me, it did two things. Number one, I might have been the first, but my most important guidepost, I never wanted to be the last. Right? It's great to be the first. Who cares? Right? One and one and done, that's no good. So my what I discovered is that with success, you gain a voice. And I like to use my voice to empower others. And that was really something that I discovered by being the only woman. I would have young women come up to me and say, oh my gosh, you know, you're a role model to me. And, and they might have been an athlete or somebody who wanted to get into baseball, or they might have, it might not have even been sports, but they saw me doing something that didn't fit the stereotype. And so it opened up their mind to the fact that there might be an opportunity that before didn't seem like it was achievable for them. But as you see somebody breaking a barrier, barriers always look insurmountable, right? Until they come down. And so it, I, you know, I, enough people started to say that to me that it sort of said, huh, okay. I get it. So I'm going to make a conscious effort to go out there and speak to people and talk to them about it because if I can do this, they can too. And that's how you make sure that you are not the last. And I'm going to say that it was certainly true for women and young women, but I also ha would have young men come up to me and say the same thing. They were almost defeating themselves before they even tried. Right. So when you look for your role models and people that you want to look up to and maybe someday to be mentors to you, they do not need to be doing exactly what you do. If you guys go on and you, you continue to play um, in, in college and beyond, great. And your role models might be Jenny Finch or Justine or, you know, people who are on the field. But they might also be people who have the qualities that you want to emulate. In my life, that's what I've always looked for. I'm not looking to follow in anybody else's footsteps because I'm not them. And so I'm probably not going to succeed at that. I'm looking for, geez, what makes that person successful? Or how does that person juggle all those different balls? I really admire how they have all these different roles and seem to do them well. So they might not have been in my field, but they had skills and were succeeding in a way that I looked up to and I wanted to learn from. And that's what I would encourage you to do as you guys go through um, high school and get into college and even into your first job. Thanks for your question, Elena. Um, we've got another young woman from Southern California as well. His name is Elsa. Go ahead, Elsa. Um, my question, I'm, I'm Elsa, I'm 11 years old. Um, I live in South California. Um, my question was, why do you think there have not already been any women playing in the MLB? 
Okay, well, that's a great question, Elsa. So two things. Number one, tell me who your team is. LA Dodgers. Ah, of course, there you go. Okay, a lot of Dodger fans on this call. Um, Elsa, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer, but you know what? I'd love to hear your answer. Why do you think? Um, do you have a thought? Um, I think it's because um, there's um, a lot of men, and also I know a lot of baseball history, and a long time ago in baseball history, um, girls started to play on their own teams, and then a girl injured herself, and they thought it was because she was a girl, like her bones are too weak. So that's why they didn't let girls play in the MLB anymore. Well, I love that you're, you're a student of the history of the game. That's really fantastic. I love that. So, you know, also, I think that there's, um, I think that there's no simple answer. And I think the beauty of the world that we live in today is, Will women at some point, will there be a woman who, it's what you guys, when you asked me about the coach, would I hire a woman coach? I'm going to tell you this. If you run a major league baseball team, you want to win. And so you're going to put the best talent on the field that you can put on the field. And if Elsa, you were that player, if you were that shortstop, or what's your position? Second base. Second base. Okay. Um, you look like an infielder to me, so I knew I was close. So if, if I needed a second baseman and you were the best second baseman available in the draft, you bet I'd take you. And I bet any general manager, male or female, if they believed you were the best player, would take you because at the end of the day, we all want to win. Um, but today, um, you know, there's so many opportunities to continue to play and play professionally. And I look at, um, you know, what's happened with women's uh, fast pitch and all of the, you know, and the WNBA and soccer and women's sports just continues to grow in popularity and in opportunity. And so for me, it's not an either or. I want to see more women playing at higher levels. And wherever that highest level is that somebody's talent means they should be at, that is where they should ultimately achieve. And if you guys, have you guys ever watched the movie, A League of, um, yeah, League of Their Own? You guys, yeah? So that's one of my favorite movies. So that's an, you know, that was an interesting time too when women played, you know, during the war and then once men came back from the war and MLB returned to what it was, unfortunately, the league um, ultimately disbanded. But, you know, again, it shows even way back then, and that's way before my time, um, you know, women had the ability to play at a very high level. So it will happen. And I hope one of you is the first. If you do, I want your autograph. Awesome. Um, we've got another question here from, drum roll please, from Wisconsin. Um, Jane from Wisconsin, go ahead. Hi, I'm Jane, I'm 12, and I'm from Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin. Um, what obstacles did you face when helping to get Miller Park built and how did you get past them? Jane, first of all, I'm from Fox Point. So Jane and I are from neighboring communities for those of you who don't know your Wisconsin geography and look at that shirt. I love it. Okay, I knew I'd get a Brewers fan. So, um, and one other thing, you must be a big Craig Consul fan. Yeah. Right, because you know Craig's from Whitefish Bay, obviously. For those of you who don't know, Craig Consul's the Brewers manager uh, and was a big league player. So the obstacles that we faced, I said it was a 10-year journey. So it was very, very difficult. And big projects, right, hundreds of millions of dollars to build a ballpark complex and it was a partnership between the city the county and the state and the team very 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 difficult i was a 
polit political science major in college, and I can tell you what I learned in college didn't prepare me for some of what I saw and experienced. Um, but it was very difficult, um, primarily because of the politics. It was also a time in the industry when small markets in particular, and I know we had Kennedy before who was a Royals fan, so teams like Milwaukee, Kansas City, Seattle, San Diego, um, really Oakland, really didn't have a chance to be competitive. It was really, unless you could spend at a certain level, it was the same teams, the Yankees, the Braves, you know, the same few teams. And so um, we really had to come up with a solution to be able to save baseball for Wisconsin and for Milwaukee, which was absolutely the ownership group's number one priority. They had brought Major League Baseball back to Milwaukee in 1970, and the single focus was always to make sure that Major League Baseball was there for future generations. And so we really had to have a three-prong approach. One was to work on changing the economics of the game, which you all are the benefit of as fans now, right? So now you know there's revenue sharing. It's, it's not a level playing field and it doesn't need to be, but it's a fair playing field. So the Royals can win and the Brewers can win and a lot of Yankee and Dodger fans on this call, they can win too. Um, and maybe it's a little easier for them, but we don't mind. We're gritty from Wisconsin, so we don't mind. Um, we're up for a challenge, right? Um, so we, so that's really how I got involved representing the small markets in the revenue sharing debate. And so that's how I ultimately got involved in the labor relations, right? They put together a group from the various clubs, large markets, medium markets, small markets. So that was one thing that had to happen. The second thing was getting a new ballpark because at the end of the day, we talked about getting fans to the ballpark and it has to be a great experience because again, I go back to that casual fan. The diehard fan will go to any ballpark pretty much, doesn't necessarily need all the amenities, but 81 games a year and 40,000 people a game, you need to appeal to the casual fan as well. So, um, an important part of getting the new ballpark was also rebuilding our team and doing it from the ground up. So we had to really rebuild our farm system with young talent like you guys. And that takes time. And it is not, you know, there are can't miss prospects that miss. And so it's not, it's, you know, some science and lots of art. And so we really had to win on all three of those initiatives. And because you're a Brewers fan, you know what great success the Brewers have had over the last, you know, five, 10 years, both on the field and off the field. And I am forever a proud Brewer. So go Brewers. Thank you. <laughs> awesome, glad you guys could find each other. Yeah, me um, too. <laughs> um, I know that we are almost out of time, so we just have a couple more questions. Um, we are going to move to um, Taylor, who is from Illinois, just down south a little bit. Um, Taylor, I know you have a couple questions, but just keep it to one since we're running out of time. Hi, I'm Taylor. I'm 17, and I'm from Winneka, Illinois. Um, and I was wondering, would you consider owning a professional women's baseball team? And do you think that a professional women's baseball league could be a reality in the future? So hi, Taylor. I know Winneka very well. So Cubs or White Sox? Cubs. Or Brewers or Brewers? Cubs. Cubs, of course. <laughs> I knew that. Okay, so we're rivals, but we're just on the call. So we're good. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so Taylor, I would love, love, love to be involved in something like that. Absolutely. And do I think that there's opportunities and do I think um, as we continue to move forward, there's going to be more and more? You bet. You bet. And I would be at the front of the line in any way to get involved with something like that and to support it. Absolutely. Would love to. That's and great. I'd love to have you guys playing on my team. 
sign me up. Okay, deal. <laughs> yeah, I have to avoid that Cubs allegiance, but we'll be good. <laughs> well, okay. Awesome. Um, all right, we've got time, I think, for one more question here. Um, yeah, and I think just to follow up on that, um, what's so cool about what so many of these girls are doing, and especially girls like Taylor, they started their own girls baseball teams and programs in their own home states to grow girls baseball. And, you know, with that momentum and, you know, support from people like you, I think that, you know, we can only see the, the game and opportunities grow for, um, for girls across the country. You're so right. And the truth is things like that grow from grassroots. You think about them from the top because once the success comes, that's how you know it. But the truth is you need it to come. You, you need the groundswell to come from the grassroots efforts. And I believe there really will be in the not too distant future, a real opportunity around that. Be exciting. Awesome. Um, so I think that we, uh, I know that um, Justine had a question as well. Justine, did you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Hi, Wendy. Um, hey, Justine. Thank you again. Uh, most of our girls are pioneers in their own leagues as the only girl or the first girl in their school playing baseball or their conference. Um, I have uh, wanted to be a professional coach since I was 16 years old. And as you know, there was no one to look up to. But I have to say that I always knew you were there. So if one woman was there, then somehow there could be more. And um, so now it's really exciting that 20 years later, 25 years later, we have five women who have had coaching roles this year in, within minor league baseball and major league baseball. How do you feel about the growth of women at, in um, the front office? That is really a testament to you being a pioneer, but, but how does it make you feel to see all these women in the game? You know, Justine, it's a great question. You and I have both been around longer. So we've seen a lot of it, right? Um, I meant what I said. It's fine to be the first. You don't want to be the last, right? And there is a responsibility. You've done it, Justine. You've been a pioneer. And look at what you're doing now. And that, to me, is what will continue to see the kind of growth. It feels like it, we will be at a really good place when it really is not an issue that we have to talk about anymore, right? And so, yes, you guys are, are pioneers right now. And, 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 you know, those of us before you went through it, and we know it's not easy. And we know um, how sometimes I'm sure you look at yourself and say, why am I doing this? Is it really worth it? And that's where knowing your why becomes so important because that's what helps you persevere through all those challenges. And when I look today at the front offices, and I think you had Kim Ng on recently, and there's a young woman who just, uh, she graduated and there's a fellowship program in Major League Baseball and she uh, was admitted to the fellowship program and she was working in the labor department here and she just got a job with the Cincinnati Reds in their um, in their data analytics and she wants to be a general manager and I'm telling you if you know her name's Katie she's smart she's driven do I think she has what it takes sure I do because it takes that kind of drive and it takes that kind of ambition and being willing to put yourself out there. And so at the end of the day, it's a numbers game, right? And I wanna see more and more women who love the game, having opportunities to succeed in whatever part of the game they wanna succeed in. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, I think on that note, I know we have more questions, but you know, to be respectful of everyone's time, I think we'll um, end it here. And I just wanna say thank you on behalf of all of us at Baseball for All and all of the girls and women that are here um, and men as well. Um, thank you so much, Wendy, for taking the time to speak to all of us across the country and to inspire us and um, provide all your incredible wisdom with us. Great, I hope so, you guys. And I just wanna say to you and Justine, great what you're doing with baseball for all. We all need to encourage each other, 
right? Empowered women empower others. And so you guys, um, as young athletes, will pay it forward and do it for those who follow you. That's what we do. That's what makes it great. And I just want to say I have loved, loved, loved hearing from all the from all the girls all over the country. You're all fantastic and you're all winners. I can tell it. Because I one thing I can do is I'm, I'm a good scout. I know talent. We've got plenty of it. This is just a small sampling of it. So I'm so glad that you got to be able to see that. But um, thank you again so, so much. And um, thank you to everyone who joined. I hope you guys got a lot of, out of this talk with Wendy today. And um, stay safe and healthy, everybody. And we will talk to you soon.